Hoyt, Corbin, entertaining and protecting the Second Amendment. Welcome back to Elster's Rifles Reloading. In the review of the Palmetto State Armory 18 inch, one and seven twist, Cold Hammer Forge Afghan barreled upper in 5.56. And trust me, this video review series is going to be epic. And yes, it is, my friends. If you guys happen to miss the first part of this video series, you're really missing out. And you're definitely going to have to check out that playlist area. Check out my channel and go to that playlist area. And this series is going to be epic. And it's just going to be just as good as the 6.5 Grendel that I just finished up. And if you guys happen to miss that 6.5 Grendel series, that's also in that playlist area. But let me uh, get you guys up on the chat boards here, make sure everyone is rolling in and that I am officially live. So let me get the chat boards up here for you guys so I can see what you're saying. So if you guys are out there, jump in the chat box and make yourself known. And Steve H is just rolling into the house here, is saying evening. And I'm going to wait a little while here for some more people to roll in. Uh, but what we are doing is going to start, well, we kind of already started. I think I have to go back and I'm about to explain that here in a little bit. But we kind of already prepped some brass here for this PSA 556 upper that has a cold hammer forge barrel. That's made by FN. And so far we're having some pretty decent results. As a matter of fact, let me grab that target over here. And for sh first shots down the tube, I would say they're pretty decent. And I wish I could show this firearm on a live broadcast, but I can't. Um, but I can definitely show you some pictures. So let's see who's rolling in here. We got Steve H in the house, he's saying evening. Cam Cam 413 saying hello everyone. Stan Lucas is rolling in the house saying evening. And uh, Jason Hunt's just rolling in saying hello from Tennessee. And like I said, if you're out there and you're watching, this is gonna be a real treat. We're gonna, next few parts, I have no clue how many parts it's gonna be, but we're gonna be reloading live here for this PSA 556 upper that's 18 inches long. And it's Cole Hammer Forge barrel made by FN. And what's special about this particular upper is, that's another thing I gotta show you here in a little bit. Uh, but, but, let's see here. What's special about this upper is it has a one and seven twist. And most likely it's gonna prefer a heavier bullet, something like a 68 grain or 75 grain boat tail hollow point, which I'm about to go over that here in this live session. And um, Maverick Anglers is rolling in the house. He's saying, hello, brother. If you guys just missed the intro of this live event, you're definitely gonna to to go back and check it out. It's pretty spectacular. Um, but with that said, I had just realized during the first part and if you guys watch this other reloading series, getting reloads ready for the PSA 556 upper with the FM barrel, we kind of prepped some brass. And I kind of wish I didn't do that now because I didn't bump the headspace back enough. And when we were out the range, and let me bring that up here. Before I took my shots on the ammunition, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, I would definitely go back and watch the first part of the series. But I had some old, old reloads laying around, and these old reloads had headspace bump of roughly 1.450. And after fire forming that brass in that video, let me get you guys a little bit closer here so you can see this. So before we took the shots, that, that ammunition had a headspace of 1.450. And then after we took the shot, it fire formed to 1.454, 
almost 1.455. Well, if you watch my reloading video series before, at least for a semi-automatic, you know I like to bump my headspace back from Fireform, which this particular upper, let me show you this. Let's see here. I think I got a picture of it in here somewhere. And I just got the Vortex 4 to 16 high power scope on there. I got a Vortex cantilever mount on there now. And I got my offset iron sights. I pretty much transferred that over from the 6.5 Grendel series. Uh, I got the bipod mount on there with the 6 to 9 notch leg Harris bipod with a bipod lock. I got some different P mags. Like if you guys watched that first part, you'll know we were having issues with that old P mag. And it's one of the first generation P mags. I'm sure that's why it's not working. So I got a, a Gen 3, I think, P mag. And it's a 20 rounds. So hopefully that works a lot better. So I wish I could show this to you in person, but being that we're live, I can't. I just got to show you a picture. Um, but with that said, we kind of hastily, at least I did, <laughs> did some brass prep. And in this part right here, getting reloads ready for the PSA upper, if you guys, some of you guys have watched that, we bumped that brass back to 1.453 based on some of my old, I should say old, some of my other 5.56 NATO firearms that I own. And most of them were fine with that headspace. But with that being said, like in that video series, part one, um, just to touch base with it, before we took those shots on that particular ammunition I had laying around that's not developed and wasn't headspace bump for that particular firearm, the ammo had a headspace of 1.450 and it, and it fire formed at 1.454. Well, you can see in this brass that we bumped it back to 1.453 based on my other NATO firearms that I own. And usually it's fine with that. But you can see here it's fire forming only a thousandth of an inch above that. Well, that might be fine for a bolt action and all, but definitely not for a semi-automatic. And that's just proves my point once again, why I use a bump gauge and don't use uh, case gauges. One thousandth of an inch right now on this brass, which I just had to re-clean and get the lube back off of it and put it in the cyclone case dryer. This brass, as a matter of fact, let me just get this brass out of here. I'm just gonna get it in a tote. Man, do I got a treat to show you guys here in a little bit. It is, you're gonna love it. It's one of my next videos coming up. And it's a special Know Your Limits target from shootingtargets7.com and you guys are really, really gonna enjoy this video series. Let's see if I can do this without dumping brass all over the place. So if you guys are out there, um, make yourself known in the chat box. And this is the Lyman Cyclone case dryer. If you've never seen my videos before, so I know some of you have. And this is an amazing product for drying your brass if you wet tumble for cleaning your brass. So being that these pieces of brass have been sitting down with old lube on them for a couple days since that last video, I had to re-clean them and we're gonna have to re-lube them. I don't wanna be sizing brass with old lube on it. It's been sitting around for days. So that's where we're at right now. And what I need to do is, I know it sounds minuscule, but I need to rebump this brass about another two thousandths of an inch. So it works for this particular firearm that fire forms at 1.454. I need to bump that back to 1.451. So I should have waited and lesson learned. I'll never do that again. Uh, I figured if it was good for my other NATO firearms, 
it'd be fine, but apparently it's not. But, you know, first initial shots down this tube is pretty darn impressive. The very first five shot group was sub MOA right out of the gate, and that's with non-developed ammunition. You know, I believe this is at 0.9 minutes of angle at 100 yards, and that was with a 60 grain VMAX bullet. Well, this particular firearm, had, like I said, has a one in seven twist, and it's gonna prefer a heavier bullet, and that's what we're gonna do. And that's what I plan on doing is in this series, although I know it's probably not gonna shoot the best, and heck, you, you never know until you, you test it out, but I'm gonna load up 10 at 55 grain full metal jacket bolt tails, 10 at 55 grain VMAX, 10 at 60 grain VMAX, 10 at 68 grain bolt tail hollow point, and 10 at 75 grain bolt tail hollow point. And just to sh give you guys an idea, if you're totally new to the game, you're not totally familiar with bullets, let me hunt down that picture here. <clears throat> so all of these bullets here, see if I can get you a little bit closer. All of these, are a .224 diameter bullet. You're like, what the hell? It doesn't say 223. Well, you actually shoot a .224 diameter bullet out of a 223 or 556. And what I plan on doing is with the first 10 rounds here, so we got 10 rounds of 55 grain full metal jacket bolt tails, I'm gonna drop 25.8 grains of Varget and I'm gonna set that at a coal, at least out of my Hornady reloading manual, that's what I, where I got that information. We're gonna drop 25.8 grains of Varget and at that set coal. I might play with that a little bit. Now this particular bullet has a cantaloupe on it. And this is very typical for fodder ammunition. You'll see this shot a lot in war. This is a very typical bullet here. It's got a cantaloupe on it and usually you would crimp your brass right where that cantaloupe is. And this also has a boat tail on it. Um, a lot of times they're even flat based, but this one has a boat tail. And that's typically what you'll shoot out of your 223s or 5.56 rifles if you buy really inexpensive ammunition. It's not a match grade bullet. I'm just gonna load some up though. I just, I'm just curious to see how it prints. Um, in part one, we've already kind of seen these two uh, being shot already, the 55 grain VMAX, and that's a flat base bullet with a ballistic tip, and we already shot the 60 grain VMAX with a uh, flat base bullet with a ballistic tip. And we kind of already seen how that uh, printed on paper at 100 yards, but more times than not, with a one and seven twist, it's gonna prefer a heavier bullet, probably something like this 68 grain boat tail hollow point. You can see how much longer this bullet is. All of these get seated in the same brass cartridge and you all get fired out of the same firearm. Just because the bullet's longer doesn't mean it can't be shot out of that particular casing in that particular firearm. It's just a longer bullet. It's heavier and what's nice about the heavier bullets is typically they like to, if you're gonna be shooting extreme long distances, something like 600 yards and plus with a 223 or 556, you're gonna want these heavier bullets not only to buck the wind, but so it can just travel further distances and it really is that simple. But the thing is, is I really don't know if this firearm is gonna prefer these two bullets or not. I very well could like to shoot these, but that's where this low development comes into play. We're just not gonna know until we test it. But that's where we're at right now. And it's, all, it's all, all part of the fun. It's all part of the game. And you're simply not gonna know until you test it out. Um, but let me check out the chat box here, see who else is rolling in. Um, we got Heathen Hammer saying hi. Alicia Carpenter is saying Grand Canyon STTE checking in. Nice. Maverick Allender saying, 
how much cooling time do you do between the different reloading grains between how many rounds put down range? I was thinking if a laser temperature gauge meter would help in thoughts. Well, I don't know if I'd go that far in regards to actually checking my bore. Usually what I'll do is I'll wait a, maybe a minute or two between groups. If, if you got more time, even better, you know, maybe give yourself three to five minutes between every five shot group if you're doing load development. Um, and what I plan on doing with this is I'm gonna spread the heat out evenly between these. And the reason why I'm doing 10 total is I wanna shoot two total five shot groups on each one. I'm gonna shoot the first five shot group and then shoot another five shot group to confirm it. But I'm not gonna do all 10 in one shot. I'm actually gonna start on the low end with five shots, work the next bullet for five shots, work to the next for five shots, and the next for five shots, and then work to the next for five shots, and then work my way back. So I'm kind of somewhat spreading that heat accuracy through my reloads. You know, and usually I probably actually only do this with six total rounds, two total three shot groups. I actually wouldn't do a five shot group, but God forbid you do a three shot group on YouTube or any forum, uh, you, you get, torn alive by not shooting a five shot group. And usually I only do a three shot group. Usually I can tell within three shots if it's gonna group well or not. And I'm a firm believer in not burning up your barrel life. You know, like I said, I probably actually only load up six of each and do two three shot groups and not burn up that barrel life and waste bullet and powder and primers and all that stuff. And I can usually tell within two three shot groups, six total rounds, if it's gonna print or not. And at least for me, I always start with the bullet first, powder drop second, and jumps third. And at least in my opinion, those in order are the most important. Usually before you even touch powder drops, you'll tell if a particular firearm just likes to eat that particular particular type of bullet. And you'll know instantly, you know, you'll shoot, you know, five rounds at this, let me bring this back up here. You know, I'll shoot a five round, five shot group with the 55 grain full metal jacket. I expect that not to be spectacular, but I'm just curious to see how it prints out of this particular one and seven twist barrel. And then I'll go to the next and you'll instantly see the group sizes shrink or expand depending on how that particular firearm likes to shoot it. And I'm expecting, and I don't know for sure, but until I get out the range, I'm gonna shoot, I'm gonna guess that the 68 and 75 grain boat tail hollow points are gonna shoot spectacular, being this is a one seven twist. And I kind of mentioned this in the previous video, if you're absolutely new, you don't know what twist rate in a barrel is. A, a one and seven twist means that the bullet makes one full revolution within seven inches of barrel. So seven inches of barrel, it's gonna make one revolution. A one and eight twist, the bullet's gonna make one full revolution in eight inches. And a one and nine, one full revolution in nine inches. And a one and 10, one full revolution in 10 inches. And that could be anything, one to 13, I've seen it all. It just depending on the cartridge and that particular bullet. And usually what the manufacturer recommends for whatever they're making. Um, and most of my ARs are one and eight twists, but this one happens to be a one and seven, and that's fine. It's actually gonna prefer a heavier bullet. I can shoot at longer distances, and I'm cool with that. And I'm curious to see how it prints, so I'm really excited. Um, so if you guys got any comments, let them rip in the comment section. Um, and to get back to your question there, Maverick, I know some guys, well, actually, they have a chamber cooler now. It's an actual, tube that you insert into the rifle's chamber at the end of that tube has a fan on it and it actually blows cool air through the chamber. And I've literally seen guys take those out to the range when they're doing low development. Matter of fact, we went to the PSA Media Days event, we were shooting one mile, and we had person after person after person shooting that PSA 6.5 Grendel out to a mile. That's exactly what they had. They had a chamber cooler out there between each person taking a shot at, at a mile and it was pretty cool. Um, so Gates Jr. Reloading saying, I got a twist rate of 8.5 and one and eight. And typically more times than not what I see in most of my ARs, except for my short barrel 10 and a half inch AR pistol, usually have a one and eight twist. And that's actually what I 
prefer, it gives you a wide range of uh, bullets that you can shoot. But like I said, I'm curious to see what this prints. But we're eventually gonna get this brass reloaded. And I just wanna show you something quick in regards to the reloading process. Usually I will buy my Lake City brass in bulk like this. I actually bought a thousand pieces of Lake City brass here. I think I got this shit for almost 70 bucks, which is an absolute steal. And this was fired, not on my firearm, but another person's firearm, a military grade firearm. And if you're in an absolute pinch, and I actually, I actually had to do this, I, I counted these, they were 99 and I was short one. You can actually, without going through the whole stainless steel cleaning process, you know, and then separating either the stainless steel pins or just the brass from the water and then throwing it in the lime cyclone case dryer. I just want to quick show you something. If you are short one or two pieces, you're damaged a piece or you lose a piece out at the range, rather than going through all that rigmarole of what I just shown you over here, what you can do is say like you're short one piece like me, and what you can do is use brake cleaner to clean your brass. And I'll quick show that to you in the pure example sake. I'm gonna take out my die here. And like I said, go to my reloading. Go to my channel in the playlist area if you're absolutely new, you don't know how to reload. I got an entire video series on how to reload. I'm not going to go through all that, but I just want to give you an idea. If you are short one piece, and this piece is right fresh raw, shipped to my door, and you can see it still has the primer in it. And what it can do if you're in a crunch and you don't want to go through all that cleaning process is this. If your reloading room doesn't have brake cleaner, it should. Make sure if it's non-chlorinated. There is brake cleaner out there that has chlorine in it, and it will eat up your dyes. So make sure it's non-chlorinated. And what you can do if you're short a piece, you're in a crunch, and I have done this before where I only wanted to load up five rounds just to test the bullet, is you can pop out that primer using a decapper like this FW Arms decapper. So now you can see I popped out the primer. So let's see if you guys can make that out. And what I'll do is rather than using my super 600 swager, I'll actually cut out, there's a crimp on this primer pocket. And I know some of you guys have seen this before. So there's a crimp, you can see around the uh, primer perimeter, there's a crimp and they usually put crimps on military grade brass. Not all brass has crimps. You know, if you usually buy factory ammunition right off the shelf at say something like Gander Mountain, it's usually not gonna have a crimp, but Usually if it's 5.56 five, NATO brass, it very well could have a crimp on it. It's usually Lake City brass. So what I'll do is I'll actually use my Lyman Cyclone, I'm sorry, my Lyman Case Prep Center, and I'll actually cut out that crimp. It does, doesn't take a lot. And I actually use the chamfer bit on here. Just lightly touch it to cut out the crimp. Follow up on the reamer. Now that crimp is totally gone and like I said I'm doing this if I'm in a pinch I'm just short one piece which I was actually I had 99 pieces one piece got damaged and then I will uniform that primer pocket and what's nice about uniforming is obviously it uniforms the primer pocket but it also cleans it out because this primer pocket is tremendously dirty see that primer pocket see how dirty it is so I'll clean this out Now you can see how clean that primer pocket is. It's clean as a whistle. And then what I'll do is with brake cleaner, I'll get just a rag of some sort and douse a rag with brake cleaner. And I'll just clean the outside of the brass. Like I said, shiny brass Shiny brass is not accurate brass. And this is if you're in a pinch and you don't want to 
go through the whole cleaning and drying process. So I'm just cleaning this up with brake cleaner. So you can see that brake cleaner does a pretty darn good job of cleaning this up. Sometimes you can just spray it right on the case, lay them all, all those pieces of brass on a cloth or something, towel. And you can clean that piece of brass up with brake cleaner. And then I'll take a Q-tip. I'll spray the tip of the Q-tip. And I will clean out the inside of that case mouth. Some more of the inside of the body. And then that's good enough. I would have absolutely no issue, absolutely no issue whatsoever in regards to reloading that and shooting it just because it wasn't cleaned in my wet tumbler and then going through the whole drying process. I mean, it literally takes an hour to get through this and another hour to get through that. That's two hours I just saved if you're short one piece. So anyway, let me um, read some of your comments. I've been blabbering here for a little bit. And if you are new to the game, new to reloading, never seen my videos before, like I said, check out my reloading playlist. And uh, I got a, an insane amount of information in there in regards to how to reload. Um, so we got uh, Gates Jr. Reloading's dropping the super chat, and that's awesome. Thank you so much, my friend. That helps so much. And that that is a, a, tr a tremendous help for this video this video my future videos and this channel and it's a great incentive to keep this ball rolling because trust me when i see this good old yt they're demonetizing half my videos i do so thank you once again um thor's axe rolling in the house saying hey todd vanessa kitty's in the house saying hi um so yeah so like i said if you are in an absolute pinch and you're short one piece or you lost a piece out the range you can do that very step to get you back up to square one. Now, we are, like I said, this has been sized, but I need to bump this back another 2,000 inch, and that's exactly what I'm about to do here. So let's get the ball rolling here. So let me get this Lake City brass out of the way. If you guys got any questions, let them rip. It doesn't matter what it is in regards to reloading or if you've got a question on this PSA 18 inch upper, let them rip. So uh, first things first is I need to get my popcorn bowl so we can lube up this brass again and bump this another two thousandths of an inch. So if you guys are just joining us, like I said, in the very most recent part of this series for the PSA 556 Coal Hammer, Coal Hammer Forge FM barrel, we noticed in that particular part that Where's around here? Before I shot that ammunition, that ammo headspace was 1.450 and it fire formed out at the range. If you guys watch that video, you've seen it. No BSing. Like I said, bump gauges don't lie. They tell you exactly what it is. You're not guessing. And that brass expanded after I fired it to 1.454, almost 1.455, but we're just going to say 454. And we need to bump this back three thousandths of an inch. You're going to knock three off the four. So 1.451 is our target head space. So just to make sure, especially I know some of you guys are new. That's why I X'd out the 1.453, because if I left it at 1.453, I'm only going to get a one thousandth of an inch headspace, and that is not enough for a semi-automatic. It might be fine for a bolt action, but they ain't going to fly in a semi-automatic. And that's why my new target headspace is 1.451. And it's strange. This works fine in my other NATO firearms. I have a NATO chamber, um, but it's not going to fly in this particular firearm. So let's get this um, brass. And I know some of you guys have already seen this before, but I need to do it again. And I hate, 
hate to go through this again, but I have to. And I need to bump this brass back two thousandths of an inch because one thousandths of an inch is definitely not enough. And we got our imperial case wax. And I went and cut my finger. I don't know if you guys have noticed my amazing band aid. It's the SpongeBob SquarePants edition. <laughs> All right, so being that I got a band-aid on this, I'm gonna put a little pearl case wax on the tip of my finger here. Put that in the palm of my hand. And I got my one-shot case lube. We're gonna shake that up. You guys, a little bit closer here. So this is kind of a recap of what we just did in the two videos ago. So I'm gonna spray the palm of my hand. And we're going to lightly dust this. And we're going to get this lubed up so we can bump this back another two thousandths of an inch. So the true headspace is 1.451. Brass flying all over the place. And I'm kind of working that brass between my fingers. I'm going to lightly dust this. Lightly dust it again. Like I said, don't over lube your brass. If you over lube your brass, you will get ear pocket dimples on the side of your case body or the neck. So if you see any dimples while you're sizing, that's a telltale sign to use too much lube. Now, if you guys remember in the previous video up to this point, we annealed this brass. And when you anneal that brass, those anneal marks will kind of disappear. So if you're new to the game, that's definitely what can happen. You're like, hey, what the heck happened to my anneal marks? And you can kind of see them a little bit, uh, but they've mostly disappeared because I've had to rewash this to get the old lube off. And then what I like to do to speed up that process is I get an air hose and if you're building your reloading room and you're about to get all your equipment and you're building your bench and all that, not only do I recommend getting a wet slop sink, but definitely get an air hose. And I'll spray, I'll just spray this down a little bit with air to cure that lube. That's about all it takes. So let me uh, check out the uh, chats here. Make sure I'm not forgetting anybody. See who else is rolling in. And while that lube is somewhat curing, because that's what the actual directions say, if you check out that Hornady one-shot case lube, you check out the directions on it, it actually says you should let it sit around for a little bit. Uh, you don't want to you don't want to size at least spray on lube that is. Imperial case wax is a whole different ball of wax. Um, literally, a whole different ball of wax. <laughs> so um, let me check out the chat board here, make sure I'm not forgetting anyone. Um, so Gates Jr. Reloading saying, my fire brass out of my 5.6 is 1.463. Now let's, I mentioned this before and I'll mention it again. Bump gauges that are attached to your calipers do not tell the exact true headspace. Let me say that again. Bump gauges do not tell the exact headspace to the very thousandths of an inch. All your bump gauges do is tell you that you have bumped the brass and that is it. That is it. Like I said, if I was to go out and purchase the exact same calipers, the exact same bump gauges, 
not this, these particular calipers and bump gauges, but a brand new set. And I got a box and I put this calipers, that brand new set of calipers and the brand new bump gauges. And I'm just gonna grab one of these pieces of brass on here. And I know this is 1.453 because you guys watched that series with me. And I'll show that to you here. So that's one point. Let me spin this brass so we get an accurate reading. So 1.4535. You guys watched that in the previous video. In that box that I'm about to ship you, a brand new set of calipers that are just like this, same brand, same headspace, bump gauges. And I put that exact same piece of brass in that box and I shipped it to you and you checked it out. It's not gonna be the same. It's definitely gonna be a little off. It'll be really, really, really close. It might, it might read, instead of 1.453, it might actually read 1.454 or maybe 1.456 and like in your example. And it's these bushings, these headspace bushings that you put in the body, they will get worn out a little bit, especially when you can see when I'm trying to get an accurate reading, I'm twisting this piece of brass in there. And over a period of years, it will wear down on this a little bit. Remember, your bump gauges just tell you that you bumped the brass. It's not telling you the exact headspace to the thousandths of an inch. And like you guys seen in the first part of this series for the PSA AR15 556 Cold Hammer Forge FM barrel <laughs> upper. See, wow, well, that's a lot to say. You watched me take these calipers out to the range. We measured that brass and it measured 1.450. We fired it and expanded to 1.454. So 4,000 an inch according to these bump gauges, not your bump gauges. So if you're watching me and you're like, wow, Todd Alfers bumps his brass back to one, he bumps his brass back to 1.451 because his brass fire forms at 454. You better not follow my headspace on what I do because like I said, this is using my setup, not your setup. And I hope that makes sense. Um, Jair Bear Tactical is in the house saying good evening. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Yep, and so Gates Jr. were low and saying, yeah, but stock 5.56, five, and that's actually a good point. I will, when I'm just starting out, matter of fact, sometimes if I get a brand new firearm, for a pure example, I don't own a six Creed more. And sometimes I will literally take my calipers to Gander Mountain or Shields, and I will literally go to the shelf and start yanking six Creedmoor factory boxes off the shelf, and I'll pluck one piece out of that box. And I literally did this at Gander Mountain one time, and an employee walked over and he says, what's going on, what are you doing? I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm not gonna buy this, I hope you don't mind, I'm just checking the headspace on some of your factory ammunition. And literally what I would do is I would grab one brand of six Creedmoor off that shelf, pluck one of those pieces of factory ammunition out of that box, and I will put it in my calipers and I'll snap a picture of it with my phone. And then I'll grab a whole different brand and I will do the same thing and snap a picture of my phone, maybe do that with like four different brands and just see how they compare in regards to what they are setting their headspace which is most likely at a bare minimum, so it works on a wide array of firearms. But just because you got 10 AR-15s with a 5.56 chamber in them, they can vary a little bit in regards to headspace. You know, when they're, they're boring out that chamber, they have a set idea, but sometimes that chamber bit gets a little dull, especially if it's on the, last leg of its life and they're about ready to throw that bit away or whatever. And the first set of firearms that were done with that bit might be to spec, but at the tail end of that bit, that chamber compared to the other ones, the headspace might be off a couple thousandths of an inch. Well, if you're bumping your headspace back three thousandths of an inch because you're going for the utmost precision and you're not using a case gauge, 
it can make a world of difference. And that's exactly what I'm kind of running into with this because my other AR firearms, I tried bumping this headspace back off my other firearms and live and learn. And I think you guys just watched this and I kind of proved it just now. And like I said, you don't reload for a case gauge or load for your firearm when it goes for the utmost precision. If you're just doing spray and pre ammo, that's fine. But if you're going for the utmost precision, in my opinion, you should be bumping back from fire form three thousandths to five thousandths of an inch. For bolt action, it's one one thousandths to two thousandths of an inch. And sometimes it's neck only, it just depends on what you want to do. Uh, but I hope that answers your question. And like I said, that first piece of ammunition that you fire out of that brand new firearm that you're about to reload for tells you everything in regards to what it's fire forming at and what you need to bump your headspace, headspace back for when it comes to reloading. So, um, Uh, so Gates Jr. Reloading saying, I don't follow your headspace, but that's a lot off from of manufactured. Now, like I said, your headspace gauge will read differently than mine. I can't say that enough. Lock that in your brain. Your headspace gauge does not tell you the true headspace. It just tells you that you bumped the brass or tells you how much your ammo is about to expand if you take this out to the range and you measure your ammo before and after you shoot it just like I did out at the range. Like I said in this picture in part one of this video series, that brass on some ammunition that I just had laying around, some old reloads, was set at 1.450. This was before I fired it. And then after I fired it, and that particular firearm, not your firearm, but mine, expanded only four thousandths of an inch. And like I said, I can't stress this enough. Headspace gauges do not tell you the true headspace. They just tell you that you bumped the headspace back. And my set will not read the same as yours. I hope that makes sense. Um, Uh, ba -ba, seer. So Gates Jr. Reloading is saying, my point is, is that with yours at 1.451 manufacturer wouldn't even fit. That just seems really low on, and that's like I just said, that's where you might want to take your bump gauges and literally go to the store, measure what your bump gauges read, what your bump gauges read, factory ammunition and what you're about to reload. And like I said, bump, heads, bump gauges do not tell you the exact headspace. They just tell you that it has been bumped. Or like I said, you can take this out to the range and you can see how much that ammunition is about to grow. And that's sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually, with a brand new firearm, I'm not sure what the, the fire form headspace is gonna be and I have no clue what to bump my brass. So literally I will go buy just the absolute cheapest ammunition I can find. Say like I buy a brand spanking new six Creedmoor firearm and I want to reload for it, but I'm not sure what the, the fire form is at. So what I'll do is I'll literally go buy the absolute cheapest soft point crappy ammo just to shoot it out of that firearm to see what it, it fire forms at. And then grab that, you know, fire a couple of them, compare them all, they're all going to be the same because every time I've done this, fire form headspace is literally the same, just like I've proven in this first part of the series. I'll grab that piece of brass and that tells me everything of what I need to do in the reloading room in regards to bumping my brass for a semi-automatic, three thousandths to five thousandths of an inch from fire form or a bolt action, one thousandths to two thousandths of an inch or neck only. Um, So let me read some of your questions here. Uh, so Gates Jr. saying, I assume calipers are accurate and calibrated, and they are, and they are accurate and calibrated. Like I said, you're not telling the true headspace. It's just, and the reason why that is, and let me explain how that is, is they try to get this headspace gauge, the insert, 
there's a little bevel on there. There's a little bevel on the inside of the case gauge or where that rides in the datum line. Well, one might have a little bit stronger bevel than the next, or this might be an old insert that I've spin brass in quite a bit over the years and it's kind of worn it down. And over the years, mine will definitely read def different than your insert. All that's doing is riding off the datum line or the middle point from where the body starts at the shoulder. And that shoulder, the middle of that's called the datum line and it rides on that case gauge. And that's it. Your calipers are reading true and they're accurate and that is, a, is exactly the case. But your bump gauge, where it rides on the datum line, might be a little off. Like I said, it's gonna be freaking close. If I send you the exact same setup, it will be very, very close within a thousandth of an inch, maybe a couple thousandths of an inch, but it's not gonna be perfect. And two to three thousandths of an inch means everything in the precision world. So I, I hope that makes sense. So, um, so like I said, your, ca your calipers are you're calibrated, they're reading true. Um, but bump gauges in general, what of what I just got done saying, it, they don't read the exact same, the, the headspace to the T. They just tell you that you bumped the brass and that's literally it. Um, other than that, I don't know how else to explain it. So, uh, hitting steel CA is rolling into the house and he's saying party. Uh, nice to have you along my friend. So I think we got this lube has uh, been sitting around long enough. And We'll get this set off to the side. Uh, so keep that in your mind. Headspace gauges, bump gauges, they don't read the exact headspace. They'll read it really close, don't get me wrong. They'll be really, really close, but they don't read it perfectly. All they do is tell you that you bumped the brass. That is literally it. All right, so, um, so I am gonna, one thing here I just want to show you guys quick before I size this brass is I got a very special video incoming for you guys and it's on a target system and it's from shootingtargets7.com and I know some of you guys have probably seen my rimfire know your limits target and I have a new one coming in it's but it's on steroids and it's for a high power cartridges you know if you here, I'll just show you, matter of fact. Now, some of you guys have probably seen this rim fire. You can only shoot rim fire up to 17 HMR with this Know Your Limits target system. And this shooting target7.com Know Your Limits rim fire edition, it starts at two inches and it drops a quarter of an inch per. So two inches, inch and three quarters, inch and a half, inch and a quarter, inch, three quarters, half, and a quarter. And you guys probably seen this before in my video series, and it's awesome. Uh, I think they sell this on shooting targets.7. It depends on the sale, sometimes they run promos. I think they're running one right now, but usually it's about 140 to 150 bucks, and it's, it's awesome. It makes it really fun going out to the range. But this isn't out yet. And it's supposed to be available here very, very soon, but you can see I got a new one and it's the exact same thing, but on steroids. And it is gonna be absolutely phenomenal. And I can't wait to get this thing put together. Like I said, this isn't out yet and it was supposed to be out, but obviously with this COVID BS right now, uh, employees can't be around each other and it's kind of slowing things down, but you can, see that it's the exact same thing but it's going to be on steroids and it's going to be awesome it's got the hangers for the gongs and just like this one here has the upright bar with the plastic spacers this one here is pretty much the same thing but obviously on steroids it, it's instead of being plastic spacers they're metal and it's got the legs and all the hardware to put this together so like <laughs> this thing is gonna be phenomenal. I can't freaking wait to do this video. And I'm just doing a little spoiler for you guys because you guys are watching live. So rather than 
two inches for empire <laughs> this bad boy starting out is going to be eight inches and each one drops one inch so eight seven six five four three two and this is ar500 and this is three eighths of an inch and it's got pretty much the same hardware, it's just on steroids. Man, I can't wait to get this thing together and do a video here for you guys. It's going to be phenomenal. And what I plan on doing is shooting this with a you know 6.5 Creedmoor 308. We're going to really bang this thing up at range too, at 300, 600 yards. Planning on shooting my AK-47. You know, most AK-47s are about three to four minutes of accuracy. Well, trying to shoot, I might do an AK-47 situation at 200 yards. Four minutes of accuracy at 100 yards is four inches. Well, four inches at 200 yards is eight inches. And starting out, that first plate is eight inches. And that at 200 yards for an AK-47 might be easy on that first shot. Maybe I'll do it at 150, maybe. Um, heck, maybe, <laughs> maybe even 100 because the very last one is two inches. Well, that's, you know, if an AK-47 at 100 yards can barely print a four inch group at 100 yards, that probably actually probably be a good test even at 100, maybe 150. I don't know, I'll have to think about that, but <laughs> it's gonna be an awesome video and I can't wait for you guys to uh, check that video out. So let's see who else is rolling in the house. Uh, OCD Outdoors is rolling. Says nice steel setup, and it's awesome. I can't wait. Um, I actually got some other steel gongs from uh, <clears throat> sh shooting targets uh, seven dot com. Uh, Twelve eight six four two. But I plan on putting out that new range of mine out at hundred yards at my uh, in laws' house. So uh, Gates Junior Reloading saying <laughs> love it. Um, so you're Send me the old one since you don't need the little one now. No, I can't give that up for my rim fire. Uh, they're awesome targets and they make it so fun going out the rain, especially if you got like a youth with you. Man, it makes it so fun, especially just watch those things whip around. Uh, so yeah, let's get this uh, resized. And I'm not gonna do this whole popcorn bore. I'm just gonna do about 10. I just don't wanna bore you guys to death. So let me make sure I got this press handle. In the picture, uh, so some of you guys have seen this already, but we're going to do this once again because this is part of the series, it's part of the venture, and that's what that's what part of the fun is in regards to reloading. Like I said, either you, you love it or you hate it. I've never met anyone that's half and half. <laughs> so, now, I know some of you guys are experts at this now because you've already seen this. Uh, but we need to bump this back based off this new fire form, which I've already explained several times here already. Two thousandths of an inch to 1.451. So we're going to reset this die. We're going to screw this down until it touches the shell plate. Give this a little bit of a turn. We're going to reset this, this sizing die. So have my q-tips here like i said we need to condition this die so a little bit of imperial case wax on my fingers i'm going to do the first case just to get you want some of that imperial case wax to rub off this first piece and into the die it's called conditioning the die and we're going to put a little bit of case imperial case wax on a q-tip not a lot you don't have to go haul wild crazy and we're gonna do that in the inside of the first case mouth. Just so this doesn't get stuck in the chamber, uh, in the die I should say, because if you don't lube your brass, you're gonna learn how to quickly use one of these. And that is a stuck case remover. And if you guys are absolutely new and you're not sure what I'm talking about, if you forget to lube your brass, one time and buy this right out of the gate. Don't buy it until you need it. Buy it right now. 
If you forget to lube your brass, that brass is definitely going to get stuck in your die. And you can buy what's called, I like to use this RCBS stuck case remover. It's part number 09340. And all it is is a tap and die set system. So it's got a drill bit. It's got the tap. And it comes with an Allen wrench and a bolt to literally yank that brass back out of the die because it's so stuck in there and you can't remove it even with a wrench. You, you're going to literally forcibly yank this piece of brass out. And what you do, if you do get a, do forget to lube your brass, is you're going to, for example, say like this piece of brass got stuck literally in my die. Just imagine this being stuck in the die. You're going to literally drill out the end of that brass, you're going to tap it, so you put some threading in it, in that freshly drilled hole, and then you're going to screw, you're going to put this on the end of the, uh, you're going to remove the pin, and you're literally going to screw this bolt into that freshly tapped hole, and this will literally yank this piece of brass out of that stuck die. So rather than waiting for that to happen and you're trying to reload some night, do it and buy it right now. Because trust me, it will eventually happen. And even sometimes myself, <clears throat> I forget myself. Make sure that this press handle is in the picture. And I think some of you veteran reloaders, you've all been there before. You know exactly what I'm talking about in regards to a stuck case remover. And it's been a while since I've done that. And of course I'm bab babbling and I'm literally resizing this piece without even checking it. <clears throat> Let me just double check this piece of brass. Once again, we're not guessing because I'm using a case. So I did bump that back a little bit. So they grab a fresh piece here. This one down about a thousandth of an inch. Still not 151, 451, I should say. <clears throat> Sorry, I should have showed you that beforehand. I'll set that one to the side too. It's not bumped yet, but I'll just, for you guys that are new. So this is 1.453, just like we resized in that other video. So 1.453, I'm gonna condition this just a little bit more. <clears throat> and we need to bump that to 1.45, 451. So let's see if this moves the shoulder at all. And you can see I'm running the press handle, at least with this particular press. I'm overcaming and overcaming, get to the bottom of the overcam and stop. I don't push down on it. <clears throat> so it's still 1.453. So we need to keep on going until I start to see that shoulder move. And it's gonna be here really darn soon. I'm gonna try not to overshoot this. So still not yet, still hasn't, that die hasn't come in contact with the data line. So we're gonna keep on going until we start to see that move. And it should be really darn close here. So it's still not moving. So we need to keep on going. Just gonna double check this, make sure. <clears throat> So like I'm doing right now, I'm setting up the die. And let's see if it's finally moving yet. Man, it's still not moving. Let's keep on going. Let's see if that 
Dai came in contact with that datum line yet. Still not moving. Let's try another piece here. So yep, still four, five, three. You need to keep on going until that moves. All right, so it's finally starting to move. So that die's finally coming in contact. So it's four, four, five, two. We don't have much to go here. Like I said, once you get this set, you can you just set it and forget it. <clears throat> All right, so we are there. You can see it didn't take much. Four, five, one. So that is exactly three thousandths of an inch from Fireform for this PSA 556 Coal Hammer Forge FM barrel. Remember, it Fireformed at 454. And I'll say this again, that is not the true headspace. This is just telling me that I bumped the brass, that's it. Your brass ejects out of your firearm and you measure this and it just tells you what it fire formed at. And then it just tells you how much you're going to bump it back. It doesn't tell you the true head space. So can't say that enough. Um, so let's try one more piece. So this should be at four, five, three. So four, five, so four, five, three. So remember, I'm setting up this die. I don't want to overshoot this. So I'm going to back this off. I want to confirm this. So. Once I've run a couple pieces through and I can confirm it. So like I said, I backed it off and it went back to four, five, two. So I'm gonna screw it back down. So that tells me right there that that should be set now for four, five, one. So I'm really close. I need to go just a little bit. And you can see how precise I'm being with this. I'm barely moving this thing but that should be set now. So I'm gonna check this, this should be right at four, five, one, exactly three thousandths of an inch, and that's exactly what it is. Four, five, one. All right, so let me go back to these other pieces that we didn't bump. So this is four, five, three. And this is all part of the adventure. You know, I thought it was going to be four, five, three, based off my other NATO firearms, and some just because one firearm has a NATO five, five, six, and it fire forms at with your bump gauges. That is, it fire forms at, for example, say it, it fire forms, and with your bump gauges, your bump gauges say that one firearm at a five, five, six chamber fire forms at four, five, six, and you can have a completely different brand manufacturer that ha has a 556 chamber and it's that could for fire form just like mine at 454 doesn't mean every single one is going to be to the t and that's i can't stress this enough you're making precision ammunition that's why you don't use a case gauge you reload for your firearms chamber not a case gauge and right there my friends 451 <clears throat> So let's uh, try a couple more pieces here. If you guys got any questions on any type of reloading, let them rip. So this is four, five, three. Let's bump this back to four, five, one. So three thousandths of an inch from what my firearm fire, fire forms at. And my using my case gauges, not your case gauges. Four, five, one. <clears throat> so lock that in your brain, lock that in your brain. And like I said, your goal is bumping this to four, five, one. And if you can get every single piece, just like I'm doing exactly four, five, one, then good for you. But it might be a little over. You can tell this one's actually a little over. It's four, five, one, five. But if this actually read something like 
four, five, zero, five, that's still fine. You're, you're so close to that thousandths of an inch, it's not gonna affect your accuracy, but your goal is four, five, one. So, so if this piece rides true, or runs true, reads true, I'm gonna lock this die down now. So I think I need to go down just ever so slightly, and I'm gonna lock this. <clears throat> You can see I, I'm, with the initial four or five pieces, I'm, when you first get your die, I'm going to play with that a little bit. So let's do one more piece and then I'm going to lock down this die. So this, this piece, we already know it's four, five, three because we already resized it in the previous video. So four, five, three. And we are going to bump this to four, five, one. It's all about consistently running the handle and your ram. And right there, my friends, four, five, one. So let me lock this down. The way you lock down a die, you never lock it down now. The way you lock down a die is you actually size a piece. You can see I'm consistently running that ram. I'm going nice and slow, slow. I'm hitting the overcam. I'm overcamming, I'm overcamming. I'm bottoming out at the overcam. I don't push down on it. I stop there. While that piece is stuck, not stuck, but in the die, that's when I lock down this nut. That will hold the die in its place. If you try doing this without doing this process, your headspace is gonna go clean off. So keep that in mind. So I'm gonna lock that down. And Four, five, one. So hope, hopefully this makes sense to you guys. And I'm gonna do a couple more pieces and then I'm gonna wrap this up and I'm gonna show you how I wash this for those guys that are absolutely new. So a couple more pieces. I'm not gonna take you through all 100 pieces. Uh, you guys would probably be brain dead if I did that. So four, five, one. Do one more piece. Got any questions, let them rip. So four, five, one. So you can get, you know, some that have micro readers, especially on seating dies that help, so you don't have to play around with it, but that's the name of the game. And you just gotta keep on doing this so you get that set head space in this regards. Uh, if you guys are just joining us, this particular PSA 6.5, I'm sorry, PSA 556. Uh, let me show you a picture of it here quick. Matter of fact, here's that shootingtarget7.com. Know your limits target on steroids, and that's it right there. Uh, like I said, I can't wait to get this thing put together and shoot this in a video for you guys. It's gonna be absolutely phenomenal. I'm curious to see how much these spin, and obviously it's all, the amount that they spin is gonna be completely dependent on what I'm shooting it with, or shooting shooting at it with, I should say. Um, but yeah, this firearm, now I got the high power scope on it, and I got the bipod on. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, it's this new series that I just started, the PSA 556 Cole Hammer Forge FN 18 inch AR upper. And we just got done with part one. So if you haven't seen this series, definitely check out part one. And you'll see that in part one, I literally took my calipers out to the range and I checked some old reloads I had laying around that had a set headspace of 4.50. We shot it and it fire formed at 4.54. And now we just bumped that three thousandths of an inch based off my bump gauges, not your bump gauges. Your bump gauges will read that different, so keep that locked in your brain. Can't stress that enough. So, 
you guys got any other questions, you better let them rip here soon. Otherwise, I'm going to quick show you for those guys that have never watched my videos before. Um, let me read some of your questions here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, OCD Outdoors is ha, ha, the last case I had st stuck. I had to send it in. And th that will happen. Even so once in a while, you'll get a stuck case in your resizing die that is so stubborn, <clears throat> even tapping it out and trying to yank it out with a stuck case uh, tool like that that I just shown you won't work. And sometimes I've seen guys where they're literally trying to gnaw away at it with a pair of pliers and they still can't get it out and uh, just don't forget to lube your brass. Um... So yeah, so Thomas, Thomas is saying everyone's reloading is different and that is totally the case. Like what I'm showing you guys or what I'm telling you guys is just my process. I'm not telling you you should follow my process. As a matter of fact, my process is an accumulation of watching other people reload and reading and how they reload, checking out forums and taking little bits and pieces from everybody and creating my own adventure. And that adventure is going to be completely d different and dependent on the equipment that you purchase. You know, obviously the equipment that you purchase is not going to be completely the same as mine. You know, like I said, you might not have this. You might dry tumble your brass. You might not even have, you know, like a, a dehydrator or a lime and cycle and case dryer. You know, you might just set yours out in the sun on a towel. You might not even have charge masters. You might use an old analog system. You might not even have a Lyman case prep center. You might do it by hand. You might not even have this type of press. You might have a single stage press. It's just completely different. And it just depends on the situation. So, um, Jibber Tech saying, good night, Todd. Another great chat. Thanks for joining us, my friend. Uh, R. Hendry's in the house. And he's saying, thanks for doing these reloading instructional videos. And I'm, I love doing these for you guys. I hope you guys are learning something. Um, otherwise, that's pretty much, I'm gonna resize the other uh, pieces of this brass offline. I just wanna give you an idea of what this journey is like. And every single firearm I get, and every reloading session is a completely different journey. It's my journey. I'm hoping you guys can learn something from my journey so you can start your own. And I do this every single time when I get a new firearm and I start reloading for it. It's, that's why I enjoy getting new firearms because I feel like I'm going on a completely separate and new journey. And that's half the fun. Like I said, either you love it or you hate it. But right now we are up to sizing brass. And if you're new to the game, this is the first video we watched. Obviously, in order to get to this step, you're going to have to pop out that primer with some type of decapper, you're gonna get it into the wash or at least clean the brass in some method, dry it, get it back out. And I would usually anneal at that point. And if you have no clue what I'm talking about, check out the playlist area of my channel. And if you're absolutely new, Go to the playlist area. And I have an insane amount of instructional reloading videos in there. If my, I'll probably go to the ultimate reloading playlist right here. So the ultimate reloading playlist, click on that. And in that playlist, I have literally dumped all my knowledge in there for you guys. And the first nine parts of that playlist is start to finish of my entire process that I do every single time, at least for some semi-automatic. 
And that should help you out tremendously if you're new to the reloading world. And I'm just gonna let you guys go on this adventure with me in regards to this PSA 556 AR firearm. And this should be really fun. And not only that, but you guys get to watch the literal reloaded ammunition done live for you guys being shot in this firearm review series. And hopefully you can take some of this knowledge and dump that into your own adventure. And like I said, if you got any questions, jump on my Facebook page. Matter of fact, I just started a whole new Facebook page. It's called Todd Elfers. It's E-L-F-E-R-S. So Todd, T-O-D-D, -D, Todd Elfers, R and R. And if you got any questions, throw me a message on my Facebook page, Todd Elfers R and R. And it's R and signed R and throw me a message and I'll try my best to answer your question. Or matter of fact, jump in the uh, community section on my YouTube channel. You can post messages there and I'll try my best to answer them. Uh, usually on my Facebook page, that's the best way to do it. So um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, so Paul is saying, thanks Todd, my press arrives tomorrow and that's awesome. What kind of press did you get? I'm just curious. Uh, if it's a single stage or progressive press. Uh, I believe you're new, correct? So let me know on that. <clears throat> what else we got here? So Maverick saying, wonderful conversation and some tips in the live chat. I do have questions, but maybe next time. And you bet. Oh, let your question rip. I'll try my best to answer right now, Maverick. Let me read some of these other uh, comments here. Uh, OCD Outdoors said, uh, sub yourself as well. Um, Robert is saying, ordered a bore scope from your link for Amazon today. And I, I highly, highly appreciate that. That helps out those. I am affiliate of, of Amazon, so if you do click on that, I get somewhat of affiliate kickback. It's not a lot, but it's, you know, maybe a buck or so. Uh, but it all adds up, and it definitely helps my channel in, in pushing this content forward in regards to protecting our Second Amendment. Um, Otter is saying, thanks for your great videos and explanation. Keep up the good work. Um, Cam Cam 14 did the same. Robert, that's awesome. Let me know how those bore scopes uh, work for you. Um, I love mine. I actually have the rigid model. I have the rigid model and I have the flexible model. So I actually have the rigid one in here. Um, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm not a huge fan of the rigid one. Uh, I'm not gonna take this out, but it's just, it's not long enough. I They should have made this thing long enough, and I don't know why they made it so short. I think it's like 20 or 22 inches. Well, how, I mean, what do you do if you got a 24 inch barrel? Um, I just like this flexible one. It works just fine. You, it's easily controllable. It's 40 inches long, so it's gonna cover literally every firearm known to man, unless you're shooting some crazy hand cannon. <laughs> um, but for $49.99 shipped, you can check out the video on that. Check out the... Uh, description box below. Um, not only does that video show you how to use it, but um, it also has my affiliate link in there. So if you do click on that, make that purchase, it does help my channel out a little bit. Uh, so I wanna be clear on that. Uh, what else we got here? If you guys got any questions, let them rip. So Maverick Anglers is saying, uh, TACMHQ structure barrels, I recall after they fired 16 rounds MOA, took readings at the highest point, had temperature go up by 11 degrees and chamber by five degrees were cooler. You know, and like I said, when it comes to load development, you definitely don't want to go full bore all the way through. You want to take uh, some time between those groups. You know, and I would say, you know, a, a couple minutes, maybe three or four minutes between each group, if you can, if you're not in a rush. Um, and it just depends on the barrel. You know, if I'm shooting like my 223 varmint bull barrel, it's literally an inch barrel all the way from the chamber to the muzzle. 
And that thing doesn't matter what I do, how fast I shoot. I can just shoot that thing all day long. It's just a two-two-three, and it's a it's a varmint bull barrel. But if it's something more like my six point five Grendel that has a medium contour A2 style barrel, that's not a, a pencil barrel. And if it is a pencil barrel, you definitely got to take your time. Heat will destroy your groups. <clears throat> but even with the A2 barrel. It's pretty decent, but I will take my time between groups. I will take a few minutes and I, I'll actually touch the barrel and see how hot it is. Um, and that's sometimes you might want to, you can actually do what's called round robin. That's once in a while I'll do that. Say like I, say like I'm doing powder drops and I got four different powder drops. One at 40.0, one at 40.2, one at 40.4, and one at 40.6. Rather than shooting, all five of one powder drop, you can shoot one round of 40.0, take one shot of 40.2, and then one shot at 40.4, you can actually load up your magazine that way. It's a lot to keep track of, it's easy to screw up. I hate removing my cheek weld when I'm taking my shots, and that is the worst thing you can do when shooting for groups, is to remove your cheek weld. Um, and a lot of guys, I get that comment all the time. It's like, you're not even hitting the bullseye. Well, I'm doing low development. I'm not going for bullseye. I could always change the scope to be on bullseye. And a lot of times when I'm doing low development, I will purposely shoot off bullseye so I don't ruin my point of impact to aim at. Uh, my bullseye, I should say, that I'm aiming at. A lot of times I'll sh purposely adjust my scope down and to the right or to the left about one or two minutes of angle, just so I don't destroy my point of aim. Uh, the group, it's all about keeping an eye on your group point of impact locations, and obviously the size of the group. You can always change that in your scope, so. Um, where are we at here? So Maverick's saying the barrel life goal up and throat erosion god down. I'm pretty sure you mean goes down. Any thoughts? And that will happen. It just depends on the firearm, the cartridge that you're shooting. Something like a 308, you can easily get 5,000 rounds out of a firearm, especially if it's a bolt action. It's not a semi-automatic. Even more, maybe. But something like a six Creedmoor might be a barrel burner and will only get about 1,200 rounds. And it depends on your purpose. If you're competition shooting, heck, you might, if you got a 6BR or your 6.5 by 47, you're a bench rest rifle shooter or something, heck, you might not be satisfied with the groups after 1,000 rounds. And barrels are always replaceable. You gotta keep that in mind, especially if you're a talented gunsmith and you can e easily swap out barrels. I know guys that are in the competition world that swap out different barrels damn near on a monthly basis. It's nothing to them. Barrels are expendable. It might not seem that way if you're not familiar with removing barrels and gunsmithing, but some of these guys at competition shoot, they're replacing their barrels nonstop. And the second they see, the second they see those groups go to hell, and sometimes they'll do that. And each barrel is completely different. A barrel is like a fingerprint. They're different just like the next human is from you to me. And you can have 10 firearms right off the line, same manufacturer, same model number. Every single one is the exact same. And you pulled 10 of those firearms right off the assembly line. Same manufacturer, same model, same barrel profile, same everything. And you set all four of those up next to each other on a gun rack at the range, and you shot each one with the same ammunition, they're all gonna shoot differently. Because when they cut that rifling into that rifle bore, some are done with a bullet uh, button process, some are rifle cut with a, like a higher end barrel, like a Bart, Bartling or a Krieger barrel. Uh, some of your more inexpensive barrels are vastly mass produced barrels are mostly gonna be a button pulled process. And they're probably gonna have a more aggressive, um, more aggressive rifling on them. It might take a little more time for the, those barrel bores to break in. Maybe in comparison like a Krieger or a Bartling that 
it has a rifle cut process and might only take, heck, right out of the gate, it might shoot amazing. You just don't know until you, you test it. Sometimes it might take 50 rounds, uh, but you might have a, a mass produced firearm that has, a, uh, has been button pulled for the rifling. <clears throat> and usually they're a little bit more aggressive. You might have to lap it or shoot, shoot a, a couple hundred rounds through it before you do any lo low development. And usually you'll know right out of the gate if it's gonna be a stubborn bore or not. And this is just something you gotta test. Um, but like I said, every rifle's bore is like a fingerprint. And in an example of those 10, they're all gonna shoot differently. It's just something you learn over the years of sh doing load development and reloading for multiple firearms over a period of years. And it's just something you gotta test. Uh, you just don't know until you test it out the range. And that's half the fun. Like I said, either you love it or you absolutely hate it. I've never met anyone in the middle, so. Um, so DMM Racer 321 saying, you hear on how good the new Hornady Auto Charge Pro is, waiting to see when it's for sale. You know what, so they're really disappointed when I went to SHOT Show and I know they're busy at these booths, most booths were very welcoming, but man, I tell you, when I went to the Hornady Shot Show booth and I tried to talk to numerous people, I mean, I think I talked to three different reps, literally had two reps arguing about who was gonna talk to me. And I know I'm not a huge channel, I'm only about 11,000 subscribers. And I'm not definitely not someone like Gavin too, but, and I get it, they're busy and they're just employees. They don't ex exactly represent Hornady, so don't get me wrong on that and Horny is a great company, but I tried to talk to someone on that powder drop and I could talk to someone to save my life. And I don't know, I I used a lot of Hornady equipment. I, I think if I was to start over though, I'd probably go with Dylan. Um, but don't get me wrong, I, I do like Hornady. Um, but I think if I was to start over with a press, it'd either be either single stage or be a Redding turret press. Uh, or if, if you're going progressive press, I'd probably go Dylan of some sort. Don't get me wrong, the Hornady Lock and Load is a great press, especially for the money. If you're just getting into it, you don't have a ton of money to spend. It is a, it is a great option. So, <clears throat> um, What else we got here? Uh, no, I haven't heard much about that uh, Hornady Auto Charge. And I'm going to be honest with you, i probably get something uh, like the A&D 120i. And they sell these kits now where you can get uh, a powder drop and a trickler kit for those. And that's probably, if you want the best of the best short of than getting like a Prometheus powder drop, that's probably the route I would go. Um, but no, I haven't heard much about that powder drop. I'm gonna be honest with you, the gold standard, if you're just starting out, and like I mentioned this before, <clears throat> at an absolute minimum, I would get a charge master. I uh, just get a charge master and most likely be done with it. Uh, I know they have the new charge master and I would probably get one of those if they weren't so flipping expensive. And that new RCBS charge master is so darn expensive. <clears throat> At that point, I probably just get an A and D120i with the separate kit for the powder drop and um, um, trickler. And, I believe they're accurate to the 0 0.02 grains or something like that. Um, but like Thoris Axe is just mentioning, <clears throat> Todd is right, you'll eventually have to replace your barrel. And they're just, they're, they're expenditure. They're just, they're just like your reloading components. Uh, what else we got here? So you guys got any questions, let them rip. I'll try my best to answer them. So M. Hall is asking, can you ask your friends at PSA if the same barrel is used in the PSA kit SKU uh, 508067? So I believe, is that the one with the plastic glacier guards that's not a free float? Um, I highly doubt it. I can just be honest with you, I really don't know. Um, and that's something I'd probably just email PSA about, or actually, it would be best if you want an instant answer, check out PSA's closed groups, uh, go to the PSA, Palmetto State Armory, 
AR-15 closed group. The CEO, Chad Wiley, is in those groups all the time. All the time. He's probably the most active CEO of any company I know. Not only is he an amazing person and just a really good guy, he gives a crap about his products. I've, I've toured the PSA plants. I, I've toured DC Machine Ferris, Dunbar facility. And the guy truly cares about what happens in his company, um, at least in regards to Palmetto State Armory as being a CEO. And just ask the question on there and he will answer it. And if you don't get an answer, just highlight Chad Wiley. He will answer your question. He's in there all the time, especially the PSA AKV group. Um, I mean, talk about a company that really cares if something's wrong, they will make it right. And I know some guys contact their customer service and they don't have the best of luck, but they are dealing in the same amount of people. I've seen the amount of product they they pump out. It's insane, it'll blow your, your mind away. So, and I actually have a video on there where I tour not only <clears throat> the PSA uh, Dunbar facility where they put all your firearms together, um, and that's in my playlist area too, um, but also the Ferris, and D, DC Machine. DC Machine is where they make your PSA barrels, and Ferris is where they make your upper and lower receivers. So they actually have the engineering department at the Ferris uh, area there, and also Lead Star is there. And <clears throat> they're all under the uh, umbrella of, um, what's the name of the umbrella company? J J JGE or something? I can't remember, but anyway. Uh, so yeah, check out the closed groups. They will answer it right there, trust me, my friend. Um, but, uh, and hitting steel CA is like, uh, LOL, you know, I hate chasing the lands. And that's what will happen when you get throat erosion. This is the lands will wear down. <clears throat> and you'll, you'll hunt down this perfect pet load and it's shooting amazing. And it's shooting amazing for hundreds of rounds. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, that pet low that was shooting amazing for hundreds of rounds just goes to hell. And it seems like that's how it's the case every single time. Like you'll hunt down this, when I say pet load, if you're new to the game, they have what's called a pet load, P-E-T. It, it's something that you've developed and something you've caretaked like a pet. And you develop this load to be perfect. And it's called your pet load. And it works great for that firearm. And you keep that for the pretty much the remainder of that, that barrel's existence. And it's shooting great for about a thousand rounds. All of a sudden, you know, your groups just go to hell. <laughs> and that's a good sign. Especially after you, you know, clean the barrel and you let it refoul out and you double check it again. And it's still shooting like crap. Most likely your th throat erosion or your barrel's going to hell. That's when it needs to be replaced. So, <clears throat> um, but, uh, Uh, so DM Racer says, Chad answer me in two days about my AKV dust cover. Like I said, just jump on. There's there is the PSA AKV group, the PSA AK group, there's a PSA AR-15 group, and now they got one for the Dagger, and they also have one for the MP, the new PSA-5. If you, if you ask a question in there and it doesn't get answered, I'd be amazed. Like I said... Uh, that Chad Wiley, he he checks those groups out continuously, especially the AKV group. <clears throat> um, so Mr. Mr. AR Guns and Gear is in the house. He says, uh, hello everyone, it seems to have arrived late for the stream. And yes, you have. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so OCD Outdoors saying, Gavin Tuba has a good video on single stage press comparison. Um, so yeah, it's one of my favorite channels. Matter of fact, I met Gavin at SHOT Show and he is the exact same in person as he is in his videos. Just an awesome guy. That guy is so infectious. I just love his attitude and he is exactly the same way in person that he is in his videos. And you know, you got Johnny's Reloading, Gavin, you know, those are the probably the, the big two. Um, some other ones like uh, uh, High Boy Reloading, um, and obviously mine, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, those, uh, 
Eagle Eye. I like Eagle Eye's uh, channel. So very knowledgeable people. Uh, AR Guns and Gear saying, I use a Forrester Coax, and that is amazing press. Uh, I was gonna, I was actually gonna get that press, um, but I think if I was to get a single stage, and it's actually not a true single stage, I'd actually get the Reading Turret press. So, um, so Thor is actually most guys that compete at the nationals they replace their barrels have two K rounds, and that's no joke. And it, every, it just depends on the cartridge and how hot that cartridge is. It also depends on how hot you reload that cartridge. The hotter, obviously, the faster you're going to burn out that barrel. So, uh, ba, ba, ba. I think that is pretty much it. So, we are up to the point of decapping. We decapped the brass. We got that brass into the wash. We took it out of the wash, put it in the lime and cycle and case dryer, took it out, we annealed it, uh, we lubed. And now we're up to resizing, and I had to rebump this back to that 1.451, like I just explained, and I can explain it again. Um, and that's it. So I'm going to get this brass after I get these 100 pieces. So I'm not going to bore you guys to death with this. But once I resize the rest of this brass to that 1.451, I am going to get the hottest water I can out of my tap. And this is the second stage of wash. It's been sized. I need to get the lube off that brass. And this is where we get it nice and sparkly. So I'm going to hottest water possible, fill this all the way to the top with my brass, put a decent squirt of Dawn in there, put a teaspoon of Let Me Shine. And I am going to put this on my tumbler for an hour and a half on the second wash. The first wash I do, I do an hour. The second one, I do an hour and a half to two hours. It depends on how much brass you're doing. If you do a, a tremendous amount of brass, you're gonna probably do two hours. Um, and then I'm gonna take this out, put it in my cyclone case dryer, and then I'm gonna see you guys in the next video, and that's where we're gonna be at. We're gonna do more brass prep, finish the brass prep. And then we are going to do this particular load development. And once we get to this low development, like I explained earlier in this video, then you're going to see me in the next part. And that's not going to be live. That will be a, a fancy edited video, <laughs> just like this other part. And if you guys haven't watched this first part, and it is epic, and trust me when I say that, this firearm review series is gonna be awesome, trust me. Well, my friends, I hope you guys learned something. And stay tuned to the next part. This video series is going to be epic, and I hope we can learn together on this journey. And that is just the first part. It's going to be numerous parts, just like my 6.5 Grendel series. No joke. It is going to be probably minimum. With the live reloading events, it's probably gonna be damn near eight parts. So if you guys got any more questions, you better let them rip. Otherwise, I'm gonna head out of here and finish the rest of this resizing. Um, I think that is pretty much it. So Maverick is saying, looking forward to seeing these rounds go down range, being a part of the venture to add to ours is one of the reasons your channel is amazing folks in the live feed are also great and that's awesome that's where we all learn together we learn as a community and that's exactly how we're going to protect our rights because your vote only goes so far it only lasts for about two to four years depending on who you're voting for 
and someone is eventually going to outvote and cancel years down the road. And the only way you're going to protect your rights is to continue this knowledge and pass it on to the next generation so they can make that vote to protect not only their right, but yours. And us as a Second Amendment community, we need to come together. And it's all about knowledge and passing this knowledge on to the next generation. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this first part of the live event. And the next part, we are going to do the remainder of the brass prep. Probably after that, we'll be seeding, uh, dropping powder and seeding bullets. And then we're gonna, you're going to see the next part of this edited series coming very soon. And it's going to be spectacular. Well, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. Hit that notification bell, my friends. Become a Patreon, and I will see you guys in the next video.